Thank you very much for coming today. And uh, both of you are deeply involved in, uh, I'll call medical philanthropy. Absolutely. And let me just ask you at the beginning, uh, when you give money away for uh, medical research and things like that, do you think you're going to live to see the results of it uh, cure these uh, diseases and eliminate them from the face of the earth, or do you think it's just a step forward? I'm hoping it's going to help. Okay. Seems good to me. No reason not to. All right. And do you think you're going to live to see the, these diseases go away, or do you think it's just a step down the road? For me, we're in for the long haul. We're taking a long view, so we'll invest for the future and hope that succeeding generations will reap the benefits. Okay, so now how did you get involved in medical philanthropy? Uh, at an early age you decided to take some of the money you earned as an entrepreneur and get it involved and put it involved in medical philanthropy. Why did you decide to do this initially in breast cancer? 39 years ago I had my first mastectomy. I was sold that I needed to do something about it. Wasn't a good deal. When I had the second one, one month short of five years, um, I really knew I needed to do something about it. Fortunately, I have been successful. Fortunately, my family has resources, so when I had an opportunity, I <clears throat> moved into that arena to invest. Unfortunately, I have um, our family, just my mother's siblings and the offspring, have seven, seven different types of cancer. And so I don't just give money. I give blood. I, I had a party and had 102 members of the family come to a, to a, a luncheon at which they heard from different, um, three different institutions working together and gave blood. They said I should have had a vampire outfit on um, before they came <laughs> in <clears throat> because we had a phlebotomist and um, okay. had 102 members of the family give blood because I figured that not only would help us, hopefully it would help a whole lot of other people. Okay. So um, you have created a foundation with your husband in 1994, is that right? That's correct. And it's now one of the largest funders for basic science research in the United States. So what would you say you're most proud of having achieved since 1994 with the foundation? Well, I think that our work in the autism research okay. initiative has really supported the science, developed a community of researchers, provided um, infrastructure for like data sets for people right. to work with. So I think that we have built up a strong community and resources to okay. begin serious research. So um, is, it, is it harmful to have a vaccine uh, when you're a child uh, if you want to avoid being autistic? There is no credible evidence for thinking that vaccines are in any way linked to okay, autism. But there are some people, some people in Washington, D.C. even, who believe that vaccines can uh, cause autism. So where did that idea come from? There was a paper that was published in The Lancet magazine and by an author called Andrew Wakefield, or I think that's his first name, but anyway, Wakefield. And um, he was later, you know, taken, his credentials were taken away. The paper was retracted. Okay. But unfortunately, it wasn't after the harm of this misinformation was okay. done. Now, it is said by some, I think, that boys are more likely to get autism than girls. Why do you think that is? I wish we knew. Okay. We don't know. Um, the prevalence rate is four to one, boys, males to females. Right. But that is one of the mysteries related right. to autism. And when a parent has an autistic child, when does the, the, do the parents usually figure this out? Is it in the first six months, the first year? Could it be three years, five years before you realize it? Well, I think that over time, our definition of autism has broadened and deepened our understanding of the symptoms. And so we are hoping to push back diagnosis earlier and earlier. It used to be three years of age when a child's language was supposed to come in. Now I think that a doctor could say definitively at 18 months, some doctors okay. are 
looking to get it back to 12 months. And sometimes people say that somebody has Asperger's syndrome. Is that part of autism or is that sort of separate? That's on the spectrum. When the DSM-4 came out, it introduced the diagnosis of Asperger's syndrome, but the DSM-5 no longer right. can contain that. Okay, so Lida, you have uh, created a center for brain research uh, in Texas. Uh, what in in intrigued you about that area and why did you decide to put money into that? I didn't actually create it. I have to take, <clears throat> I can't take credit. It was there, but I supported it because my nephew um, um, flew uh, with the Navy and uh, with the Air Force. And um, so he had a lot of okay. friends that were suffering from PTS. I now know you don't put the D on it. It's PTS. And um, fortunately, they have been, they can reverse that. And I was hoping that by um, philanthropists putting the money in to do the research to figure out what, if something okay. can be done, that the military would pick it up. Unfortunately, they haven't. So I have spread that information and some money in Colorado Springs, where we have five military bases. It's my summer home. And um, so they are working with um, vets there to assist I them see. and other people. Not so just in Washington, D.C., taking credit for something you didn't do isn't considered a big problem. So, um, <laughs> so you can take credit for something. It wouldn't, it wouldn't shock anybody here if you took credit for something you didn't do. Um, people would say that's the part of the course in Washington, but okay. So um, what kind of progress have you made in PTS, for example? I'm very excited. I've been able to see the, um, the, the testing they've done. And, and as a matter of fact, the program um, um, on 7-7, not a date for many of you, but in Dallas, that's when we had the pl terrible police shooting. And um, I immediately, the, the next week, um, was talking to the Center for Brain Health, and I said, she said, we think that we ought to spread this and try this in some of the police departments. I said, Dallas. She said, no, no, Lada, small, I said, Dallas, now. This was within five days that we lost all those policemen. And so we're doing it with the police. The police are very happy with it. They are, they are delighted okay. um, to be able to receive some of the training. So some of these things can spread okay. when you look around and pay attention. Now, how do you both deal with this issue? Um, lots of people have serious medical problems, and they would like research done about those. They send you letters and say, can you put money into this, or can you help me with my rental research needs here? Do you have a standard letter that says, I don't do this, or how do you turn people down? Who does that? Or people approach you directly and say, why don't you fund this, and what do you, how do you say politely you don't do that? Well... We do get lots of requests, but we try. There are different kinds of ways to respond. One is sometimes um, we like to compliment people on the work that they're doing and say that we really respect the efforts that we're making. We have to stay focused on our priorities, and but we also, you know, are watching what they're doing and respect their efforts. So um, sometimes it's, you know, not in any way related. Okay, well, let's talk about autism again. Let's suppose somebody is autistic, uh, diagnosed as such. Um, can that person live a life that um, would take them to the normal lifespan of a, of a regular person who doesn't have autism, or does they have a shorter lifespan? I think life expectation is the same. Same. As for anybody else, as long as they have a family to help support um, life skills. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. And um, you are involved as well in some other uh, in cancer research? You do some... Uh, in, in yes, we've supported particular projects in cancer. Um, Larry mentioned our supporting his efforts. Um, I think we're motivated when we have gone to an outstanding doctor, as Larry is, who's both a physician and a researcher. We really want to help okay. those doctors expand their efforts and reach more people. Now, one of your side jobs is being chairman of Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. Is that right? Yes. So that's a very famous uh, place on Long Island. I used to serve on the board of it. Uh, and. Um, what are they doing to make the world a better place? Well, they definitely have the goal to, you know, introduce, like, pursue basic research, but find ways to benefit mankind or humankind. And I think last year 
one of their researchers, Adrian Craner, received the Breakthrough Re Award. He has developed a therapeutic intervention called Spinraza for the treatment of spinal muscular atrophy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, up until then, any child born and receiving an early diagnosis of SMA would probably, it would be fatal, and the child would, uh, okay. with the most serious mutations, die early. But now we're finding in the control okay. studies, they put all the children on the medication because it was clear okay. that it was so enhancing survival. So if you were, survival. if somebody is diagnosed as autistic, for example, back to autism, um, you, you, once you have the diagnosis, what do you do with the diagnosis? Do you get special education? Is there medication? Is there something? What is the most, uh, the, the most likely thing that somebody can get in terms of improving their situation if they are diagnosed as autistic at, say, three, four, five? At present, your best way of helping is through education. Okay. So finding you know, speech therapy, occupational therapy, physical therapy, and going to a school with a special right. program. If somebody is diagnosed at three, four, five, or six, or whenever it might be as autistic, um, is the conventional practice that you tell the child that they are autistic? Or when do you tell a child they're different than others? And do they really understand what you're telling them when you tell them that they're different? So you asked earlier about Asperger's syndrome, and I got into the details of the DSM-4 versus the DSM-5. The big change was that the term autism spectrum disorders was introduced because there is a very wide variety in the expression of autism from some children who have need a tremendous amount of support, who might have self-injurious behavior, right up until people who are probably functioning in terrific research jobs at universities, and they are savant in their knowledge. So there's a very wide spectrum of okay. phenotypes. So Lida, you have given money in lots of different areas. Medical research is just one of your areas right. of philanthropy. How do you compare the pleasure of giving money away for medical research with the pleasure of giving away for so many of the other things that you've been involved with? Some of them are more fun than others. Um, Lee Berger um, from National Geographic, when I got to go down in the Rising Star Cave before it made the front page of the, uh, all the cover stories and he became the number one person of the year, was really cool. That was really fun. Right. I, I really like that. And, and I've got him bringing, what, one of the things exciting, between October and March, and this isn't out yet, between October and March, Homo naledi's bones are coming from South Africa, and South Africa doesn't let bones out of South Africa. Homo naledi is who Lee Berger, the pre-man that, uh, uh, that um, Lee Berger found, and the bones are coming to the Pro Museum in Dallas and will be there for a six-week period. And we have okay. one of the underground astronauts there, so it's going to be very exciting to be able to have um, them okay. there, and people see them, and it's the only place that's going outside of South Africa, then they go back to South Africa. So to be able to do something like that for your community, for your country, is not a bad deal. It's, um, it's a lot of fun. And the thing that I started um, two weeks ago, which falls, I think, falls in the medical arena, if then, was this big program that we've been working for a couple of years to put together, because we need, young girls need to be inspired to go into STEM. If they can see them that, that look like them, then they can be them. But right now, young girls only see old white men in STEM jobs. We need the entire population working going forward. And so I think I'm helping the medical community. I think I'm helping bioengineering. I'm helping a whole lot by creating this project. We've got 37 different groups working with us, bringing things together. As he was talking about, you've got to bring different groups together. And we're very excited about the potential that it has to inspire young people to want to go into STEM occupations. But old white men do have some virtues, right? <laughs> oh, old white men can be good sometimes, yeah. right, yeah. Yes. But, but we don't want to totally replace your pictures, but one of the things okay. we're going to do is take pictures. I'm funding 100 um, um, grants for 100 um, early stage women in science, and um, you see the stories. I've 
putting many millions into this effort to so that we can have okay. the whole population going into these things. Now, um, both of you were initial signers of the Giving Pledge, right? right? So you signed the Giving Pledge, did people call you up and say, well, give to me, or what kind of attention did you get for it, and why did you sign the Giving Pledge? I was stunned. I had told my assistant that we were going to need a trolley to go get the mail, and I was stunned. <laughs> I didn't get all those, ma those mails. Right. I was amazed with the first one that came from some lady in, in Netherlands or someplace, and her grandson knew how to stop this planet that was going to asteroid that was going to hit planet Earth, and, and this was her, uh, her the Swiss bank account. I mean, that one, I should oh, have you, kept that. No, I, 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 I funded I that one. I, that you didn't did work? That yeah. too. <laughs> I funded B612, which is a legitimate effort with Ed Liu to, to stop planet Earth from being attacked by asteroids. But that's, that's, another, that's another thing I funded. But I was really surprised. I, you know, I wanted to be in the Giving Pledge because I knew that I had already said that I was going to give 100% of my wealth away, and I wanted to be around people where I could learn. I wanted, I knew that I could learn from other folks, and I wanted to be in. And I wasn't on any of the okay. list. We had worked very hard in our family so to get us all off the list. We weren't on any of those lists of wealthy people. We got off of them. Okay. So I had to have, I had to have a friend call the Gates and said she she qualifies. She actually qualifies. Okay. So you have not only signed it, you and your husband, but you are the only people who've signed it who also have two children who have also signed. Is that right? That's correct. Correct. So um, that's pretty impressive. So you contributed three different families. <laughs> Nobody else has contributed three different families. So what do you talk about at Thanksgiving? Just the giving pledge? Or? <laughs> I have to say, some people start family foundations. In our case, we didn't all share the same mission. When we started our science, uh, Simons Foundation, Jim and I said our mission would be to support basic science research. But Nat and Liz said if we wanted them to get involved with our foundation, we had to change our mission. So Jim said, why don't you start your own foundations? Okay. So they did. and. Um, Everyone is very busy pursuing their own mission and vision. And I had to do that in my family, but I'm brother and sister, and um, we had a very small foundation, but it had the same problem, is that they were going in different directions. And I said, okay, we're separating this out. You get a third, I get a third, you get a third, that's it. It's worked out. Okay. <laughs> so when you signed the Giving Pledge, uh, you and, your, and Jim and your family, um, uh, have you regretted it because you get a lot more attention, or do you find any benefits to signing the Giving Pledge? And do you find any, benefit, find any benefits to giving, signing the Giving Pledge? Jim and I always had the intention of making the gift and giving the money away. And we had already started by with our foundations. Um, but um, now I lost my train of thought, sorry. <laughs> Well, now, your but foundation, well, is it a spend-down foundation? Or no, is it, it will perpetual? exist in perpetuity, All right. yes. And, all right, and why did you do it that way? Some people now say oh, spend-down. Well, I know what I was going to say okay. before. That was, Jim agreed to sign it, but he's not a joiner. You know Jim. Right. So he said, I'm not a joiner. I don't want to go to the meetings. But we went to the first meeting, and it was really interesting. Really As Lida was saying, you learned so much from yeah. the other people. So Jim said, well, I went this year, but don't make me go next year. Okay. So we went the next year. <laughs> and then his kids joined, and they were going. So we went. So it's become a regular thing. So in the medical research area, some people say that smoking is not healthy for you. Yes. Uh, your husband has been a cigarette smoker for 66 years. Um, have you ever mentioned it to him that maybe it's not healthy or? <laughs> so, well, Jim knows his math and he knows statistics. <laughs> Everyone who smokes doesn't necessarily get cancer. So he has been always hoping that he would be in that subset okay. of people. Who Is he allowed to smoke at home or? Yes, we have um, a working agreement, but I will say this. When I met Jim, I smoked. Oh. 
And, um, Did he convince you to drop it? or No, no? it turns out, <laughs> well, he was instrumental. This is a little bit of a divergence, but it's funny that um, I didn't know I was pregnant, and I didn't miss smoking one day, and Jim said, I said, did you, I, didn't, I barely smoked today, and it didn't bother me, and he said, let's see who could go the longest without smoking. So the next day, I said, did you smoke yet? And he said, of course. And I said, gee, I didn't smoke, and it didn't bother me. So the thing is, though it did bother me to not smoke when I drank, so I did essentially stop drinking. So now Jim tells people I tricked him into marrying me. Okay. Right. He thought he was marrying a drinker and a smoker. Right. No. So. But, but, but he can smoke in the house. Yes. OK. And uh, you're not a smoker, I guess. I don't smoke and I don't drink. OK. And that's why I'm in such good shape all right. so long now, after my mistake. But you have said, I thought, that you wanted to give away all your money while you were alive. Is that right? Or something? Plan on it. Plan on that last check bouncing. You bet. OK. <laughs> that's, that's, why, that's why I work out every day. Okay. All right. <laughs> well, you have longevity in your family? Uh, yep. My father had never been in the hospital, and he um, went in to have hip replacement so he could for his tennis at 84. and. Um, got a blood clot and that is, but yeah. Okay, so. But it doesn't matter. I'm in good shape. I mean, I, I mean, I work out. I worked out this morning before I got on the plane to come here. I mean, you know, you just got you got to you got to play with I, what works. I have and all I the. And I read all the medical stuff. I'm, I may not have a PhD, but I read all the medical stuff about what okay. I should be doing. I have all the athletic equipment too, gym equipment. I, my theory is by osmosis. If I walk past it, maybe it'll <laughs> rub off on me. I don't know if it'll work or not. We'll find out in time. So. Um, that's an interesting question. You're, you're a PhD in economics. So when the scientists try to explain things to you, do they try to do use scientific terms? Do you now understand them very well? Or do they try to, you know, kind of put it in a level for a non-scientist? How do you like it? More scientifically trained uh, jargon or not? The way Jim and I divvy up work around the foundation is we make the big vision decisions together. Jim works with a lot of the scientists. I'll attend the annual meetings, but being that my background is in economics, I love running the business, and I also handle our outreach. Okay. So I oversee our outreach program to disseminate the information. And how big is your foundation in terms of people working there? How many people do you have? We have around 350 people now. And we're growing to 450. And so we are a grant-making institution. And we have also recently added an internal research group. And we will have 250 scientists working at our foundation, all focused on computational science. And the brief story there is that Jim made the money using computational methods to understand the stock market. And we both felt that if we could use machine learning, computational right. methods to advance right. science, that that would be a really good use of the money that was right. made so that way. For those who may not know, Jim, uh, her husband, is a uh, brilliant mathematician, one of the best known mathematicians in the country when he was the head of uh, the math department at Stony Brook and also uh, taught at MIT and other uh, great places. He also uh, then started Renaissance, which became, I would say, the most successful hedge fund in history um, with compound annualized returns that are staggeringly high. And um, uh, that's how he made the money, pretty yes. much. Right. Okay. I, I had a chief scientific officer working for me for a while because I started a um, venture fund, a one-person venture fund, called Remeditex, Remedy Texas. Right. <clears throat> and we had, um, had staff looking at different things that were coming out of medical schools and different ideas, and then we would fund some of them. The thing that I saw when I first, with Northern, was investing in um, um, early stage life science um, ventures and funds was that First of all, the early stage, they needed another 20 million. That's not real early in my book. They could have started a little earlier. Right. And, but also, 
getting from the, if you want to get from the, from the bench to the bed, you've got to have a business head in there. So I had the, we sold our oil company, so I had the head of my oil company, financial guy and a, a lawyer, run Remeditex because I wanted the business expertise. Right. And we have um, three, uh, see, we've already had two companies go public and we've got three more that we hope are going public this year. Okay. <clears throat> so I had a kind of different, different approach All right. um, to it. Now, you're a serial entrepreneur, right? and your first company was in the travel business. Is that right? You built yeah, one of the largest after, travel after, companies? After the lemonade stand and the paper route at Stanford, <laughs> right. <clears throat> yeah, travel agency. We okay, that from scratch. so um, today, are you you're spending most of your time giving away your money, or are you still in the business world? I'm spending most, I, I have sold a lot of things, so that I don't need to deal with that. Although some of the things that I've done are, like when I started the Oklahoma uh, Breast Care Center, it was a business. It was the year that American Cancer Society said that at 50, every woman needed to have a mammogram. Well, there were a lot of boobs that needed to have their picture taken. So that looked like a business opportunity to me. And so it was off-site. Um, I could talk to my friends because of my experience in getting a mammogram and, and, until I said, they said, okay, okay, well, I'll shut up, where I go. Now, as soon as I said the hospital, they'd go, mm, I could tell they weren't going. So this was a freestanding clinic with a radiologist up there and we had the different, there were three different modalities available at that time. And right. so, um, yeah, it was a for-profit deal, but I guess now they call it social philanthropy or whatever. I've been doing stuff like that okay. for a long time. I just right. do things that seem like the right thing to do at the time. So in your philanthropy, what's your biggest regret? Um, that I didn't start it earlier. I'm having so much fun. This okay. is just great. Okay. And I try to do things that are going to make a difference, but also... And if it makes a difference, that's fun. That's, that's, that's exciting. Two weeks ago when we were on, on stage at the American Museum in, in New York, that was fun. We had 37 different people popping up on these stages saying why they were joining us. And they were all really cool people, organizations. Marilyn, any regrets about what you've done or haven't done? Well, I think just starting out, there probably were some um, errors made in supporting different projects. It was, we started our um, foundation back in 1994, and at that time, there wasn't a lot of information you could get from other people. We were mostly reactive to proposals that were coming to us. There weren't, there wasn't a chronicle of philanthropy. We didn't, both Jim and I came from middle, middle class families. We didn't have any history of giving in our family. So I think we learned right. um, through experience. Okay. One of the handy things, as soon as I could, um, I had people start a website and that handled the stuff that was coming in. And so we now say, <coughs> go to the, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> I have allergies, <laughs> go to the website and look at the website, and you can fill out an LOI on the website if you're invited to. Okay, so um, you increasingly see more women involved in medical philanthropy. Is that the case? Right, absolutely. And we had a breakthrough award winner. The first woman breakthrough award winner was Helen Hobbs from Dallas, from Southwest Medical. Okay, and increasingly the scientists you're hiring are, I assume, female or not? Oh, we hire a lot of female scientists and. It depends, some areas of science have more women in them than others, but it's growing, definitely. Okay. So let me make a comment, if I could, about my own medical uh, philanthropy. Uh, it's not as grand as uh, what you have done. Um, my own view and, is that the most important message to convey to people about medical philanthropy is that the U.S. government and governments generally don't have enough money to solve the problems that uh, you think they might be able to. NIH has a large budget, not as big as it should be in some in my view, but there isn't enough government money that's going to solve these problems. So I think it's important that people recognize that government cannot solve these problems, and you can't just sit back and say, well, NIH will come up with a solution or, or some uh, equivalent organization that's government funded. So I think it's important for people uh, to say, if you're going to do something with your money, uh, one of the best things you can do is saving lives. And, and when you think back on it, what is it that humans um, want more than anything else. Generally, living a long life and a healthy life for themselves and their, and, their, and their progeny. That's what people want more than anything else. Living a long life and a healthy life 
for them and their children. So what's the best way to do that? Well, it's probably not funding certain things that don't relate to that, but funding things that cure diseases or cure uh, problems that just haven't gotten enough attention. And in my own case, I've tried to find a few uh, diseases that probably aren't getting as much attention as they should because they can be called orphan diseases by some or they just don't have as many people that are suffering from and therefore it isn't as much medical research. Let me give an example of one that I've been involved with, which is uh, a pancreatic, uh, pan 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 pancreatic cancer. Um, uh, some of you, I'm sure everybody's heard of it, but pancreatic cancer probably affects maybe 40,000 people a year die of it, and about 40,000 or so a year get pancreatic cancer. Pancreatic cancer doesn't get as much attention as breast cancer, lung cancer, because just it's compared to those, it just doesn't have as many people. And so it hasn't been as funded uh, as heavily as some other cancer research. And, and um, so I have created a center at uh, Sloan Kettering to do more research on that. And in, um, uh, I would just say for those who've heard about this disease, um, the reason it has a high, um, uh, I'd say, rate of, uh, of death, unfortunately, is that uh, most people don't get it until, or know they have it, until it's the, uh, stage four. Um, stage four, uh, and the reason is there's no symptoms. We don't have a marker. With PSA, with, with, with prostate cancer, there's a PSA, uh, or and there's a blood test, PSA blood test, and you can tell whether you've got some predisposition to have um, prostate cancer, and obviously with breast cancer, you have mammograms. We don't have that with uh, pancreatic cancer, so unfortunately, not until stage four do you typically have uh, uh, some symptoms, and the symptoms, in case any of you are wondering, are you know, back pain, jaundice, among other things, and stage four, it's very difficult to, to cure it, so that's why the survival rate is roughly the same as glioblastoma, mm -hmm. which also doesn't have a lot of symptoms until stage four. Glioblastoma probably has like uh, pancreatic cancer, about 2 to 5% survival rate after five years. And that's uh, one of the areas that I uh, will announce something in soon as well. My other area of medical research is one that, and I, I picked pancreatic cancer because I didn't have anything in my family that was uh, related to it. I just thought it, was, it needed some funding. It wasn't really, it wasn't a center at Sloan Kettering related to it. There's something else that I have funded recently, or funded years ago at Johns Hopkins, which doesn't sound quite as life-threatening, but it's hearing. Um, uh, it's a hearing center to try to figure out how people, and they get to be my age or older, can actually keep their hearing. Um, people may not realize this, but hearing, um, uh, we have roughly in each of our ears about 20,000 so-called hair cells. They're not really hair cells, but they call them hair cells. And during the course of your life, they deteriorate and die. In birds, hair, hair cells re regenerate in the bird's hearing, so they somehow figured out how to, how to regenerate their, their hearing when the hair cells die. So one of the things we're researching, and Hop it's just at Johns Hopkins I've created this center, is try to figure out how we can get humans to have their hair cells regenerate so that maybe they won't need hearing aids or maybe they'll be have better hearing uh, during their uh, lifetime. So those are some of the things I've been funding. And some of these areas didn't have as much uh, money going to it as I thought maybe should, so that's why I got involved with those. David, I yes. think that what you were just saying about the hair cells, that it points to how b funding basic science research um, can really like translate ultimately into um, ways to help humankind. Right. But sometimes when you're funding the research, it might not seem so applicable. Well, it's, um, you know, it, when humans first came out of caves as homo sapiens, roughly 400,000 years ago, some would say, um, the life expectancy was 20. Uh, when the beginning of this century, or the 20th century, the life expectancy in the United States was 49. Today, you're born in a reasonably uh, middle-income family. Uh, you probably have a life expectancy of 80, 81, 82, 83, or something like that. And uh, so clearly, humans have been living longer, in large part because of medical advances, nutrition, sanitation, and medical research. And I think what you're doing in your medical research, no doubt, is going to help prolong uh, life and make people happier. So I want to thank you mm -hmm. uh, for doing that, and thank you for signing the Giving Pledge, and mm -hmm. uh, thank you for uh, all the things you've done to make this country a better place with your medical research philanthropy. Thank you. Thank you.